right. And if you, if you would, please put it in plain mode so we can see it. All right. Please proceed. All right. Thank you very much. Um, it was a perfect compliment, I think, to Colonel Wilbur's testimony here because uh, um, kind of got a unique experience regarding this whole election process. Um, first of all, I am a former Michigan State Senator. I served on the Senate, Michigan Senate Elections and Government Reform Committee. I took those duties very seriously to the point of diagramming out all of our election processes. So I had a pretty good understanding of how elections are supposed to work from a book perspective. Um, but uh, I have another perspective that's useful to this discussion is that um, something that I couldn't do while I was running for office is actually uh, I served as a poll challenger in Detroit at the AB County Board um, for the election day from 5 p.m. through the next day into the evening of the following day on November 4th. So I was actually at the Detroit AB County Board and heard about all the things that happened there, all the cardboard up on the windows. Yes, I was there. I was one of the people blocked from returning back into the Detroit AB County Board so uh, I could resume my duties as poll challenger. I was up training our next batch of poll challengers as to what they need to look out for and what we had been seeing. And uh, coincidentally, by the way, that was when they were counting the military ballots, which um, just you have to know, that's when they duplicate the ballots because the military ballots come in in a format that's different from those that can be read by these tabulators. And if you don't have a Republican and a Democrat watching that, it's ripe for um, malfeasance, if you will, and that's exactly what happened. So along with that background, I'm actually a certified Microsoft Small Business Specialist. In addition to being that, I actually did cabling design at the International Space Station, so I, I, I have no problem working with technology. So it's kind of a unique background, and, uh, um, and just so happened that I was right there on the Detroit AV County Board on the night of the election. Uh, so I'm going to focus in on just highlight three areas of the diagram that Colonel Waldron just showed you because uh, that's important for everybody to understand for people on the ground. These are the key pieces of technology. You talked about ImageCast Central, it's the equipment that I witnessed out at the Detroit County Board. It features a high speed scanner and a workstation associated with it. These were networked in turn with uh, adjudicator machines, which anything that was rejected by the high speed scanner would go over to this adjudicator machine. That was part of the absentee ballot counting suite, if you will, for Dominion. In addition, they had something that uh, was called local data center, where all the election officials would work from a central uh, computer workstation with a series of laptops, et cetera, that, uh, that were connected to the rest of these computers. We'll get into that in a little bit later here. But that image cast central area is one of the key pieces of, uh, or key um, um, systems, if you will, that are on the ground um, for the absentee ballots in particular. If you're at an in-person polling location, you'll have the image cast precinct um, set up, and that's on the right-hand side of this diagram. Up on the top is kind of the local data center and the uh, kind of the um, eye in the sky, the overarching look at what's going on with the election. And uh, we'll get into that in a little bit more detail later. And as you guys know, Dominion Voting Systems was used here in Arizona in Maricopa County and um, they were using some of the same equipment we were just talking about in regards to ImageCast Precinct um, and also ImageCast Central can use a scanner there. So I, I said that I was in your position before, right? So if I were in your position, these are kind of some of the key questions I would be asking in regards to all that we're hearing about this testimony regarding this election. Number one, was the chain of custody for the election artifacts broken? And thank you very much, uh, Senator-elect uh, Townsend, for bringing that up. That is a key term for everybody to understand, chain of custody. And uh, we're going to go over a little diagram on specifically where some of my comments are going to focus in on in that chain of custody. All right, and the key is to hit the right arrow. All right, and was there evidence of election fraud? There can be fraud that happens that may not even violate statute, but you know that the intent is there to defraud the election and they take advantage of loopholes that we have in the law. For example, in Detroit, we know that there was an ability for people to vote both at the poll and uh, absentee. So some people's votes were more important than others. Was there evidence that election statutes were violated? Yeah. Uh, in Michigan, we have evidence to suggest that's exactly what happened. Was there evidence of foreign agents with the ability to manipulate the election data um, and third parties getting access to that data. We believe that uh, we've seen evidence of that as well. But um, 
the other thing you need to ask is, well, all right, what are we going to do about it if we see all this happening? And what options do you have as legislators? All right, so let's go to this chain of custody. And I, I, I could go into a lot more detail in this chain of custody, um, and I'll, I'll, but I'm gonna, I like to simplify it into just four key artifacts. Qualified voter file, i.e., who's registered to go off and vote in your state. Number two, poll book. That's a precinct-specific extract of the data from your qualified voter file. Um, the ballot itself, pretty important artifact, right? But then, in the spirit of the old Stalin quote, it's not he who votes that counts, it's the one who counts the vote that counts. you got to look at the ballot tabulator and how the votes are tallied. And that was my focus um, when I went to the Detroit AB Counting Board. I was one of those folks that was not specifically assigned to any particular counting station. I was looking at the big picture. And we'll go over what I found here in a sec. First of all, everybody uh, hopefully has seen the idea that there's been a lot of voter uh, anomalies. This is our first clue that something's happened. When you're on the ground, you can see all the things that are happening, you know, onesie twosie style. And you say, hey, wait a minute, that, that, that envelope was backdated. Or you can see that they adjudicated something in favor of the Democrat instead of the Republican or something like that. That's easy to go off and see, but it's very difficult to see the big picture. That comes out afterwards with experts like Colonel Waldron. And in this case, we first started seeing issues when people were talking about Benford's law being violated. That's actually used in criminal court cases to determine whether or not fraud existed. So that was the first indicator that some of the analyses we've seen flag that. That's not proof. I mean, it's, a, it's getting the, the, it's telling you that it's, uh, uh, you've got something off here that you got to investigate. Then we've seen linear regression analyses that there's a lot of noise in, but it seemed to indicate a pattern of vote distribution that indicate some data manipulation. Then, most recently, we have actually seen folks who believe that they've identified specifically what the algorithm was, that was used to switch some of the data. Um, so, some other things that were kind of odd, and you don't see while you're necessarily on the ground, but in retrospect, you'll be able to get access to it. This is actually documented as part of the affidavit that was submitted in a lawsuit that's um, put in Michigan by Sidney Powell and, and in other states. And uh, you guys have voted quite a bit. You guys are, most of you have already served in office, right? Do you remember any of your votes being tabulated with a decimal point on the back of them? I, I don't remember any. My eight years serving in the Michigan Senate, anything, any times where I actually had a decimal point after a vote tally. So that would suggest that a partial person was voting? Uh, well, sometimes, you know, there are people that tried to make you feel like a partial person when you serve, but uh, no, that wasn't the case here. Um, and so you guys have probably all heard about what I call the little switch, the Antrim County. We've heard testimony on that already today and some of the things that could possibly happen. Getting into the um, possible technical app, uh, uh, reasons for that is maybe you have an internal ballot barcode switch on it where they have one barcode uh, style or, or ballot style that's flagged and then when they associate a specific scan of a vote, they flip it over to a different barcode style that may have the voters or the, uh, the candidates flipped in it. Um, something else is something called a rank, rank choice voting algorithm. That's one of the modules inside of the Dominion suite. And this is where you might see evidence of, this is the only place that I know of at least that can start putting in fractions into your vote. Because if you meet a certain vote threshold, it'll go off and switch that, uh, it'll, it'll prioritize the votes for the second choice, if you will, and give them 10% of the first choice of, of whoever, um, of the, uh, or 10 or 10% or whatever number you specify. It'll actually get into the point of allocating percentages of votes to one of the candidates. Another thing is data manipulation via remote access. And another thing to look at as you guys investigate what happened here or didn't happen inside Arizona is take a look at your public accuracy tests. And there are people that, uh, this is usually in Michigan at least, it's specified what the standards are for that by the Secretary of State. And if you don't run all the possible permutations of, of votes that might happen on a given ballot, you may leave gaps that can be exploited. And I would submit, we're going to show one of the examples of where we believe uh, one of those gaps is that you could uh, maybe flip a vote from a certain candidate to a write-in candidate and preload this with write-in candidates, and we think we have evidence of that happening in Detroit. So, if you want to go off and check into this, one of the things you're going to need to do, so, yeah, yep, is look into uh, uh, compact flashcards, event logs, and paper vote tallies. So, these uh, 
tabulator data cards. That's where the compact, uh, that's where a lot of the election data we've been wanting to look at is going to be located. So please make sure you get your hands on that. Then we talk about the big switch. I'm not going to get any detail on this. Suffice it to say, in Michigan, you know, our current vote deficit for President Trump is being projected as 154,188 votes. Um, we got more than that that we can tie back to potential fraud. So in the state of Michigan, I know a lot of people have written us off in this context, but I tell you, Michigan's in play because of what the, the level of fraud we've seen. So here's what our Detroit 80 counting board looked like. And essentially it was set up, so there's 503 precincts in the city of Detroit. They put in 134 of these image cast central stations all the way around. That's where the poll books were located. Um, and uh, there are about two to five uh, precincts per um, image cast central unit. Uh, we had five poll workers per station. Overall, I would submit there was probably less than 10 Republican workers um, at that whole night sitting at those. And, by law, we're supposed to have a Republican and a Democrat adjudicating ballots. Here's what I said that I was looking at the big picture when I got in there. I was looking at the big picture. First question I asked was uh, one of these chief election officials, uh, his name was Chris Thomas, I said, who I worked with when I was serving in the Senate. I said, uh, what, uh, how are you going to protect the chain of custody around the tallies of the individual tabulators and, and your report outs to the county and all points beyond that. So we, ta we talked about the idea of this getting reported out to New York Times. You can see it on CNN and all that kind of stuff. Right. Show me how that chain of custody is protected. And this election official who was uh, state elections director in Michigan for two decades said, I don't know. Now this is kind of an important data point, don't you think? Um, so, he, and I was badgering him the rest of the night and I said, you know what? Uh, he finally acquiesced and said, tell you what, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. Um, and then finally, the last statement he had on it, because I was pretty persistent, was saying, you know what, I'm not going to tell you until after tomorrow. And I go, well, you know what the primary duty of a poll challenger is to make sure that the election process are ex executed effectively, efficiently, and accurately, and transparent manner. He did not allow that to be done. Now, I can see physical transfer of data. I can watch when somebody moves a flash drive from a tabulator to a central station, and I can go off and verify vote counts at that handoff. I can't get inside wires to go off and trace electrons through the Ethernet cables that I saw position, and that's the next point I want to highlight. And this is something important for you to understand here, is how these were connected. A lot of these election officials will swear up and down that none of these machines were connected to the Internet. And that's based on propaganda being pushed by companies like Dominion Voting Systems. They will say that they have an air gap. They will say that they have firewalls in place. They have encryption in place. And I hope to demonstrate here that that doesn't mean a heck of a lot. Uh, and uh, any hacker worth their salt knows that if one computer is connected to the Internet, they're all connected to the Internet, firewall or not. And so here's a diagram that I put together based on, and I, this is literally midnight the next night uh, before I forgot everything. I wanted to make sure I documented everything that was there. I went through and physically traced all the cables from all the tabulators and adjudicators to the local data center at the, big, at the uh, top. So it's that local data center that uh, we have election officials that did confirm that that was connected to the Internet, but they said none of the tabulators or anything else were connected to the Internet. I can show physical connection between those tabulator, uh, uh, tabulator machines, the Ethernet cables, two routers or managed switch. It's tough to tell from 12 feet away. Um, but they're, it's a router type of device connected to all the other devices on this network. And as Colonel Waldron pointed out, it's designed to work as a network. And so all these tabulators were connected to one another, all the adjudicators were connected to one another, the local data center that they acknowledged was connected to the internet were connected to these tabulators and adjudicators. So, um, and so if that wasn't enough, we went around to all the different computers and observed in the bottom right hand corner of all the computers I can't do this because it defaults into a certain slide presentation mode but if you have laptops that are window enabled and you're connected to the internet you roll over that and you got a Windows 10 device roll your mouse cursor over in that bottom right hand corner and you'll see a LAN internet uh, a connection icon and you roll over it's going to pop up and say connected to the internet uh, they wouldn't do that test for me to go off and demonstrate that yeah so guys it's uh, serious stuff and I also wanted to highlight I took a snapshot of what the Wi-Fi connections were at that point in time. And uh, one of them is called AV underscore connect. I wonder what that was connecting. Um, part of their spec that they have in the contract with the state of Michigan that are supposed to be connected to be Ethernet cables. And they even have um, cellular-based uh, modems that they can plug into a lot of these 
uh, items to transfer the data over the internet. Um, they've got a Dominion Tech Support Manual that says connect it to the Ethernet. Um, there's no denying that this was network connected. And by the way, even if they say it wasn't connected to the internet, in the Detroit AV County Board, I can trace a physical connection that says um, that uh, the uh, system that was used to tabulate 172,000 plus votes in the state of Michigan was all networked together. So even if it wasn't some guy sitting in, a, in an ice shanty in Antarctica connected to the internet, that one guy in the city of Detroit that had access to all that information could modify the votes locally there. And so why does it matter? Well, we already talked about these man-in-the-middle attacks. We talked about there in the Sidney Powell uh, lawsuit that's out there. There's additional exhibits that highlight that these passwords are available on the Internet. And when you have a man-in-the-middle attack, you think you're getting the right data. You think you're talking to the right person, but you ain't. You're talking to an in-between guy. Um, we also got NAIST that left a key under the mat. What do I mean by that? All the specs on what files to look for, what their file size is, everything else for the voting system is left up on the internet for everybody to go off and say, I went there myself, I could download this file, took that extract from it. You can find out everything you need to go off and manipulate as a hacker. Um, and we've got challenger observations on the ground that attest to each and every one of these. And I uh, just want to highlight one of them, the poll worker observation, that we actually, he actually observed the fact that the printout of the tape said that there were write-in candidates on it, yet when you actually he will test in his affidavit that there were no write-in ballots submitted. Senator Colbert, yep. we're out of time. Yep. So thank you very much for your testimony. Um, we also appreciate uh, the slide deck that you presented. And if you are willing, would you please distribute it that to uh, the members of this panel? And I'm sure um, Mayor Giuliani would like to have it as well. I will leave a copy right. for everybody. Any questions for this gentleman, Mayor? No, or would you like to move on to Anna Orth? We can move on to Anna right. Orth. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, Anna Orth, would you please come up to the uh, witness stand?